Good morning. My name is Terrence Lewis. I'm an attorney with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And today I've been asked to speak about the top three legal trends in virtual healthcare. By way of background, I have been with UPMC for approximately 15 years working in the telemedicine space. Today, I'm going to share some good stories, some very, very tough stories, and where this is all going from a legal perspective. And so just to jump right in, I am sure a lot of you are familiar with this LP by Pink Floyd, The Dark Side of the Moon, that came out in 1973. In the music business, unlike healthcare, a band like Pink Floyd can distribute and sell that album worldwide with very minimal regulation. Maybe there's taxes and copyrights and things like that, but basically for 50 years, the band Pink Floyd has been selling Dark Side of the Moon by a vinyl, tape, eight track, CD, and now digital download. And they don't have a lot of issues with respect to how they do that. We're all in healthcare though. And we know in healthcare, things are a little bit different. There are many roles. There are many different things going on today that impact those roles, including COVID-19. So I wanted to walk through today, these top three legal trends. and. To me, this is really more about measuring risk and doing the right thing for patients. Those are two very important aspects of what I do as a legal advisor for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. To start, we all know that providers need to be licensed. They have to have a professional license in the jurisdiction in which they reside. Basically, the role is throughout the United States and the world globally, if a provider wants to provide telemedicine services to a patient, they must have a professional license in the jurisdiction where the patient is located and the state or jurisdiction where the provider is located. So in our slides, we have an example. If a provider, a physician, let's say a neurologist is located in the state of California and they are providing or they would like to provide telemedicine services to a patient who needs those services in Milan, Italy, that provider must have a license both in California and in Italy. And we get a lot of questions and we've always gotten questions about this. Well, why do I need to have a license in Italy, I'm in California, that's where I'm at, that's where my office is, and that's where I've always practiced medicine. Well, the answer is state medical boards, whether that's in the United States or say in the EU, look at where the patient is located to establish where the provider is practicing medicine. So in this instance, the physician must have an Italian license if they're going to practice medicine via telemedicine. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the intricacies of this, and there are some exceptions and things. But in general, if the provider is beaming out to another jurisdiction, they're going to need to have a license in that jurisdiction where the patient is residing, as well as in the jurisdiction where they reside. So just as a little aside on that, if the provider is residing, let's say in Los Angeles, California, does not have a California medical license, but has an Italian license for some reason, the California Medical Board could in fact have jurisdiction over that provider, even though they're treating patients overseas. And the reason for that is, is they are within the jurisdiction of California and medical boards will take the position that if you're in their state, even if the patients you're practicing medicine on via telemedicine are located in other jurisdictions, you may still be subject to all the rules of California, which would obviously require a medical license. 
Now, one of the things that comes up in our world today with the technology being as vast as it is and the clinical expertise growing every day is, well, how do we do this with respect to patients? If we don't want to have to get 50 state licenses or licenses overseas, is there a way to do this? And what I've come up with is really, there's a delineation line. The line really is, am I practicing medicine, meaning am I providing direct patient care to a patient um, when I have a telemedicine encounter, or am I really providing what we would sometimes call a consultation? That's all going to depend on the facts. Two examples here. One is, if I'm in Los Angeles and I'm beaming into Italy, and on that live audio video on the other end is simply a patient from Milan, Italy. There's no provider with them. They're not at a facility. And I go ahead and assess, diagnose, and recommend a treatment plan to that de facto practicing medicine in Italy. So I will need that license. But let's take another example. What if the patient is located in a facility, a hospital perhaps in Italy, and their provider that's on the ground there, the local provider who's responsible for the patient's treatment reaches out to a physician in Los Angeles that is a neurology specialist and they need help with this patient. Does the neurologist in Los Angeles need a license? In that instance, they may not um, based on the model we call provider to provider consultation. However, that is going to depend on each state and jurisdiction. Uh, some states and jurisdictions are very comfortable with that. As long as there's another provider on the other end with the patient, they're not concerned that the specialist that's beaming in via telemedicine would need a license. But it does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and it can be tricky. The real key is who is actually making the healthcare decisions. And that's what's most important. Basically, if the provider that's located with the patient is ultimately responsible, one could argue reasonably that that provider is responsible, they are licensed, and the telemedicine provider that has beamed in to provide some consultative assistance is in fact not practicing medicine, but providing a provider to provider consult. Okay, as we go forward here, one thing I also wanna mention about licensure is this. Licenses are extremely important for our providers. It is the lifeblood of a professional career to have a license. I have a legal attorney license in a few states in the United States, some of our physicians have state licenses in multiple states. What's most important is, is to protect those licenses and keep them in good standing. So when we're looking at projects to, to work on to expand our telemedicine, we have to be very cautious and make sure that we are doing everything to mitigate any risk that would happen with respect to the provider's license. Another important legal issue in virtual care today involves patient privacy and data security. We all know, uh, just looking at the news every day, the number of data security breaches that are going on around the world. And that has a great impact on providing healthcare. Why is that important? Well, we know that in healthcare, we are subject to very strict standards of protecting patient privacy and data security. In the United States, we have a standard that's called the HIPAA standard, which is a federal standard, which has minimal requirements that must be met. Some of our states have, including California, have even stricter standards. And when I say HIPAA has minimum standards, they're very heightened standards, um, but certain states can have even greater standards. So that's important.
The other thing that's very important is the EU has even stricter standards than the United States for data privacy and security. And so this is a hot area that continues to be expensive and time consuming for healthcare providers and health systems around the world. But we know in telemedicine that we're held to the same standards as if you walk into your provider's office and see them in person. All of the data, all of the encryption, all of the technology must satisfy the standards of the jurisdiction where the patient is located. And that's very important because now, as we've talked earlier, in telemedicine, we may, the jurisdiction may be somewhere in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, South America, and they all have different standards. So just please keep in mind that privacy and data security issues are not going to go away and do everything in your power if you're engaging in telemedicine on a platform to make sure the technology meets and exceeds the standards required to protect data. Last thing I wanna talk about today, and I really appreciate the time, and this has been a real privilege and honor uh, to do so, is patient consent. This is an area that is really uh, ripe for issues, legal issues, risk issues, et cetera. The general role is just like in the practice of medicine in the office, the patient must consent in advance of the telemedicine encounter. The level and standard of consent is gonna depend on what the jurisdiction or state where the patient resides says what needs to happen. So if the consent is we need something in writing or it can be oral, that should be documented by the provider in the patient's medical record. One of the things that's come up is, a, is another difficult issue here is if I go onto a website today and I want care from say a provider in the United Kingdom and there's a box that has terms and conditions and it says in order to proceed with this visit, you must check yes to this box and agree to the terms and conditions. Is that sufficient consent? Is digital consent sufficient? One would argue that it most likely is, but these are issues that are still being resolved worldwide. And so I think we're gonna continue to see a lot of consent issues around telemedicine. The, what my advice always is keep it simple, make sure the patient knows what the visit's about, what's gonna happen, whether you're recording parts of the visit and always, always document that in the patient's medical record that they have consented to the telemedicine visit. Thank you very much. And I hope that everyone has a great conference.